I, I define League MX as the shooter shot league. You do expect higher performances and better things from Club Americas, but it's the inconsistency. With the well, thing isn't with this inconsistent, though? I will maintain that the U.S. men's national team came out to the knockout round despite terrible coaching. Like, do they have a student discount, maybe, to go to a Club <laughs> game? Like, they got it, right? No. <laughs> take that next step i think it's still undisputed that you have to go to europe he's gonna well, be on the ground for the majority the, of the time. no look back at highlights that's, no that's, if that's you the have... christian pulisic treatment though same we're gonna and... have to stop this we're gonna start arguing on this podcast aren't we hello hello and welcome to another episode of the real football show i'm lizzie u.s editor over at 90 men covering north american football with me my co-host gino Ganello. how are you Doing well, Lizzie. Doing well. Uh, lots to talk about. MLS, lots. League MX. We've got actually some international talk this week as well. So yes. tons of fun stuff. It's, oh. uh, you know, a beautiful day outside. So, you know, let's, uh, let's, let's get to and talk some soccer. Let's get into it. What do you have for us, MLS? Why? Yeah, we'll start with the MLS. So quickly, we'll talk about, I just want to mention St. Louis. We talk about them literally every, every single week. every single thing every we've week. done, I think, since the beginning of the season on 90 minute social accounts on this podcast has included St. Louis. So I think we've exhausted the topic enough, but I mean, yeah. again, they look phenomenal. They Great win three nothing over San Jose in uh, at home in their second match um, at home at City, at Park. City Park. Yep. At City Park. Uh, they win three, nothing. They become the first expansion franchise ever to start a season four or their inaugural season with four straight victories and i yeah. believe the fifth franchise in the history of the mls to start a season with four straight victories they're 12 points uh, they have 12 points on the season five points ahead of lafc who has one less game than them uh mm-hmm. in the west um and they're two points in up in the supporter shield i mean they have not really missed a beat and this, yeah, this season so far, and they've been really good. So I feel like we need to mention them. I don't want to talk about them and get into them too much because we talk about them every week. But um, I think they did a really, really good job. Um, they've done a really good job so far this season, and they deserve the credit. So Yeah, we notice you. We just won't be talking about you again. Yeah. We'll talk about you again. It's just at this point, I feel like we're exhausting the topic. I don't want to, you know, yeah. we got to talk about some other teams, and which yeah. we will. We're going to move on now to uh, we'll talk about what was the game of the week, probably going into the weekend. Um, LAFC versus Seattle. Uh, this game took place in Seattle. It was LAFC's probably first real test of the season. We've seen they beat the Timbers, but the Timbers have not really had a great start to the season. Yeah. Um, they won again the week after, who which I can't. It's slipping my mind who they played the week before this. But this was their first real test against Seattle. And uh, they were held to a scoreless draw. Your thoughts on the match, Lizzie? Um, I thought it was quite boring to begin with. Yeah. Um, it was really slow. The game was dragging. I didn't quite see the level of competition that I'd hoped to, given the stellar weekend of the um, game of the weekend. And considering the figures on either side, I know... Edwin's not a huge fan. Our producer is not a huge fan of Jordan Morris, but he's, he's been well. He's been good so far. Um, but yeah, no, I think I was just disappointed to see either side perform in a me- mediocre manner. Um, but I think with these games, especially LAFC versus Seattle, you either have like so many goals, stellar on either side, or just like a boring zero zero. And we got the yeah we got the ladder. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I mean, I think Seattle controlled a lot of the game in the beginning. They didn't have many of the chances, but they seemed to have more of the chances. It seemed like LAFC mm-hmm. was very flat in this one, yeah. really up until about the 89th minute. And then they had like four really good chances in the span of two minutes, and then the game was over. And that's really what the extent of this game was. I mean, we, um, we, we you know, we, we, come into this match and we're expecting okay i mean these two teams have looked really good yeah the thing with seattle i think is seattle's been very good defensively so again this was lafc's first test against a good defense to attempt to get a victory and and score goals without chicho rango and they were unable to do that in this one and really were unable to impose any will on seattle up until the very end of the match so um 
you know, it's I'm not, I mean, listen, we're not, we're not worried about them, but it right, is just right. an interesting, it was, it was just a very flat game. There's really not much to say about it. I guess more, I, I, I wonder more about Seattle and really? where, where you feel they fall in this West. I not, not wondering as in the, in, in worried about them, but I wonder where you see them in the West because they've been very good. But are they better than the LAFCs and some of the, well, I guess the St. Louis cities uh, of the world? And, and where do they fall in the West maybe come playoff time? What does this team look like at the end of the season? Where, where is it standing? Yeah, it's interesting you mention Seattle's defensive efforts this time around because as we saw during um, their run, very short run in the club World Cup, it was the defensive errors that got to them. Mm. Um, an own goal by Alex Roldan was embarrassing to say the least um i'm guessing brian schmerzer adjusted and really drilled down on them to get to where they are at this point i think we've seen what we've what we've had to about seattle given their Concacaf champions league run um Mm. their mls cup runs in the past i think they've kind of just plateaued at this point we keep expecting some type of creativity or something different from the team but realistically we're not seeing game changing players and we're not seeing a new system put in place because Brian Schmertz is still there and mm-hmm. I'm not minimizing his efforts or what he's created over at Seattle but I'm just saying there's nothing new coming in so they'll make the playoffs of course um I just don't think they're about to deliver something that will shock us my guess is they come in fifth or sixth going into the playoffs they probably make it to semifinal if Mm-hmm. And then bow out there, but which again is is good. Um, it's it's sad that this is their norm, I guess. But I just don't see them coming in and rocking the Western Conference with something we've never seen before. And as for LAFC, as you said, we don't necessarily need to worry. But I think this is the moment, or the game against the Seattle Sounders was the moment that they missed Chicharango because as we know, he was that creative sub that came in, changed the game, usually scored a goal and broke the deadlock for LAFC when they needed him to. And this time around, they didn't have a player like him on the bench. Now, Dennis Wonga, Carlos Vela, they're all great players, but you needed that extra kick within the bench to come in in minute 65 when Carlos Vela simply can't do it anymore and inject creativity, energy, just like a rocket strike. And they don't have that in Chicharango anymore. So that's, those are the games that hurt LAFC that they don't realize are cause of a Chicharango transfer. Now it's not as evident because he wasn't regularly in the starting 11, but again, they used him as a sub. They don't have him anymore. It's a question of whether you have the depth or not in the, um, in the bench. And I think this game, they did not. Yeah, so just jumping back to Seattle real quick, I think I look at the standings and I'm not sure there are many teams that are better than that than them four games into the season. Now, this doesn't right. say that they will hold throughout the season, but looking at the standings now, I think they're better. I, I think they will end up being better than St. Louis City, and that's no disrespect to St. Louis City, but St. Louis City is going to hit a bump in the road at some point right. and they're going to fall down the standings. They're not going to, they're not going to be the best team in league with season one. They're just not, they're not uh, Seattle's better than FC Dallas. They're better than Minnesota. Austin looks awful right now. Yeah. San Jose. I think they're better than Real Salt Lake and Houston. They're better than, and those are the teams in the playoff spots right now. So I'm not sure that there's a team that other than LAFC that's better than Seattle. So I could see them if they can continue this form, Finishing probably top two or three in the conference, whether that makes them MLS Cup contenders or not, I don't know. I think a big factor for them is their home stadium. I think when they right. play at home at Lumen Field, I believe that's what it is. I'm pretty sure it's Lumen yeah. Field. Um, that's a huge factor. There, that stadium is always packed. It's always got a lot of noise in it. There's always a lot of excitement around them. And when you get to playoff time, that will be you know, exaggerated even more. So right. I can see them. I don't know if they're a MLS cup contending team, but I can see them getting the playoffs and making a decent run in the playoffs right. um, purely because 
one, I don't know who is better than them right now other than LAFC, and two, because of their home field advantage. But my concern with them isn't necessarily what goes on on the field, but more so away. And mm-hmm. we saw this last season. They were so great in CONCACAF Champions League to the point that they won. And then there was a huge dip in the results in MLS. And it wasn't because there was a change of players. It wasn't because there were injuries. It was an emotional component that they simply mm-hmm. couldn't recover from. And those are um, Christian Roald Dunn's words, not mine. So what will happen if they experience something time consuming, emotionally draining, what will happen to the team? And it's not like this season, there aren't distractions. We have leagues cup in the middle. There's gold cup where I'm sure that we'll see um, some players report to international duty. There's MLS all stars in the summer nations league matches sprinkled throughout the year. So can this team keep up with the demands of a busy schedule this year? And again, I don't, question their abilities on the field. I think they they have good players. I think Brian Schmerzer has done a good job of establishing a style and technique on the field. I, I just worry that they cannot compete and they showed us last year that they really cannot. So that's the only reason I think they'll fall to fifth, sixth. Because St. Louis, for example, when you talk about the dip or falling out of the momentum and experiencing a loss, I don't think it'll take a huge toll on the team because that's probably what they were expecting at the start of the season. Like this is how they're handling the surprise, but if they lose or something, they might readjust and that's expected of them. Whereas once St. Um, not St. Louis, once Seattle loses, I don't think they can necessarily recover as quickly. That's where these good teams go down. Yeah, my my only counter argument to that would be uh, that I think it's different this season. I think it's different than Concacaf Champions League and having Concacaf Champions League to deal with because as opposed to it just being five teams from the MLS that are dealing with Concacaf Champions League and everybody else doesn't have that to worry about. Right. Uh, you know, Seattle with Leagues Cup and all that other stuff. Every team is having to worry about all that other stuff and. And, and my counter argument to the St. Louis argument would be St. Louis has never done any of this before. None of their right. players have, ex- well, some of them have, but they're, as a team, they haven't experienced this stress of the, the, the major schedule changes and, uh, you know, the, the, you know, over use of, of games and, you know, the, the, the over scheduling of games and stuff like that. So right. I, I, that would be the only counter argument that, but I see your point because, if Seattle falls, um, you know, we have to see if they can get back up because they haven't fallen yet, really. They've been right. good. They've been solid. We have to see if they fall to a team or have a two or three game losing streak, if they can pick that back up and then change things and get back into, in, into uh, you know, overdrive and start getting back to, you know, winning ways. So that'll yeah. be when we are able to tell. But I think right now they've gotten off to a good start, a better start than they did last year. Yeah. And I think that's a huge step forward for this team. So, Yeah, I think beyond that, it's just the pressure. I don't think Seattle Saunders knows how to handle pressure to an extent. Whether they learned from last year or not, we shall see and time will tell. But that would be my biggest concern for them. Fair, fair. Yeah. Well, let's talk about another team that has impressed so far this season. Let's. Let's talk about Atlanta, who just yeah. absolutely dominated their game against Portland 5-1 victory Almada shines again two goals and an assist Caleb Wiley gets a goal and an assist Araujo I'm never going to get that name right he (laughs) gets a goal as well I think I think he gets a goal and an assist as well all their top players are firing on all cylinders GM I I, their new striker whose name I'm not going to pretend to pronounce I think it's Giamakis or something like that is um he gets right. on the score sheet. So really, I mean, everything you could have wanted from Atlanta this weekend, you got. Yeah. Um, they've been phenomenal. How have they been so good this season? Um, I don't think this is a surprise, to be honest. Um, Gonzalo Pineda is a phenomenal coach. I think last season they struggled for things out of his control. I think obviously we know Miles Robinson was out and he was a huge part of their back line. Joseph Martinez issues off the field really took a toll on the team as a whole and trying to appease him by 
putting him into that starting 11 really rocked the team. I think now we're just seeing Gonzalo Pineda do what he wants with the squad and put players in their place, and it's working out. I, I don't think this should come as a shock. They do have individually have great players. The Almada is phenomenal, and as we've said before, there's no chance he spends an extended amount of period in this league. I think he's off. Um, and we will be posting this to our social media channels a little bit later, but we spoke to him in January and I asked him about a potential move abroad. And he mentioned that when the moment comes, he'll speak with his family and make the best decision for him. And at the moment he was focused entirely on Atlanta United, but it was the subtle wording that when the moment comes and he knows it's coming, he knows there's going to be a moment where he's going to get a phone call who knows what team and what league, but the best in Europe are definitely watching him. And as they should, his goals yeah. are stunning goals. Ridiculous. Just Three ridiculous. Picks. He is unbelievable with the ball at a spot kick. Like, yeah, that curve to the upper right corner, phenomenal. From um, 35 yards out. Like, that's like to put it like, that's the thing. Like, he has, there is no one hotter in the MLS right now, I don't think. I mean, he's got, I think, four goal contributions and four, four assists this season. Four assists in four um, games. And he, I've never seen someone be so precise with yeah. free kick, or in a while, not ever, but in a while, I haven't seen someone be so perfectly precise with free kicks. In Major league. league Soccer, yeah. In in any league. I mean, you think about James Ward-Prowse, who makes his living on free kicks for Southampton. I mean, yeah. Tiago Amada does that, and then is also phenomenal in every other aspect of the game. Yeah, I think the combination of his abilities are great, and the fact that he's so young, so still able to be molded by whatever team comes his way is he's on the rise and it's great. Yeah. So you have him in combination with Caleb Wiley, a good defense with Miles Robinson at the helm. Like it's no wonder that Atlanta is doing well. And you pair that with a good coach who understands his players, understands the game. I think it's, there's no reason Atlanta United can't be top of the East for, an extended period of time and potentially heading into the playoffs as leaders. Yeah, they look phenomenal for, so far. And I want to make this point. This is not, Amada's free kicks are not just because he's playing in the MLS and it's MLS. Goal. Right. Like these goals are, would, would have been goals in any league in the world. Like the goal he had uh, from the free kick spot in uh, on Saturday would have been a goal in a lot of other leagues. This isn't just MLS. So, you know, he's just performing at a level that, you know, it, we have seen only very few times in the MLS. And he's been phenomenal so far this season. And I think, my personal opinion, this is, you know, my hot take, my maybe overreaction of the week, is mm -hmm. that I think he's gone by the summer. If, really? Because I think a team will put in enough money. I mean, he's getting views overseas already. Like, I saw somebody, he scored a goal, he scored the goal, and I saw somebody who from that was he lives in England and he tweeted about the goal and he's like sign this kid right now. So I think he's getting a oh, lot hi. of attention. the question which I know you're going to bring up is will the price be too high for them because in the middle of the season the price is going to be higher from an MLS team from an MLS team than it would be in say the winter. So That's not even my biggest concern. I think I think it'd be beneficial for him to stay through the year and finish the season. And in the past, I would have said that that's how it'll go about, but we've seen how volatile this market can be. And Chelsea, for example, picking players up in a matter of minutes with unreal price tags is, was previously unheard of, I guess. So I wouldn't be surprised if he leaves by the summer However, I think it would be to the player's benefit if he leaves in the winter and finishes the season, ma like maintains a rhythm, and then transfers over probably December or January. It's so hard, right? Because you got to say, it, it, the way the MLS season works in comparison to every other season in the world, which I think makes it very hard on a lot of these players, is that transferring in the summer – you get to join your new team in their preseason, spend the full season with them, get going with them, you know, the full preseason with them, whatever, get going with them. But you have to leave your MLS club in the middle of your season, halfway through your season. Right. Whereas in the winter, 
you leave while you're not with the MLS club, but everybody else is in midseason form. Everybody else is in the middle of the season. And now you have to get up into midseason shape well, and, and get used to your team while everybody else has been clicking or working or working together for four months at this point. So I that's think, like, yeah. that's the hard part about the MLS. And I think it's, you know, a, kind of a double edged sword because you're not going to get the benefit of both. You know, it's like, it's never going to be fully perfect from if you're coming. Yeah. From I think, unfortunately, I, I don't think it'll depend on the Aguamala and his abilities, whether he's gone by the summer or the winter. I think it'll depend on what each of these bigger teams or European teams need. Yeah. So I think but he depends. Like, need him. I would sign him tomorrow for Everton. So, you know, oh, like, okay. I don't think he wants to go there. I don't think he does either, but I'd sign him literally tomorrow. So uh, I, will, I, you know, I think he's, you know, I think he's going to get whatever. I, I think there's teams that are going to need him. It's a question yeah. of whether he thinks it's the right opportunity for him. Right. Cause we've seen before with other players in league MX, MLS, whether, no matter what it is, we've seen before that, you know, these players have, turn down certain opportunities because it wasn't the right move or wasn't a big enough yeah. club or, you know, stuff like that. So we'll see if it's the right move for him, but I think yeah. in the, in the summer, somebody's going to come for him and it's a matter yeah. of whether he makes the decision, I think, but I think somebody comes for him in the summer and I think he's gone by the summer. That's my hot take of the week. Interesting. So. Um, just back to Atlanta real quick. I mean, we've talked about them being good, but we haven't really seen them play a team that's top level caliber yet. Okay. Are we worried about that and the fact that they've, I mean, listen, San Jose is very good. We've seen them be very good, but they're probably not finishing in the top four of the West, right? Right. Toronto is not finishing in the top four of the East. Charlotte's not finishing in the top four of the East and Portland has looked awful so far this season. Right. Are we, maybe reading too much into this or is this Atlanta team built to beat those teams? We just haven't seen yet. Cause it hasn't been on the schedule. Here's the thing with this Atlanta team. And we saw it against San Jose where they were um, losing for the majority of the match and then came out with a win through two free kicks. I think that's the magic of this Atlanta team is I think they can get themselves out of difficult situations. It might not be the prettiest win and it might be a couple of one zero victories against maybe tougher opponents, but at the end of the day, that's still a victory and that makes you climb the um, table. So whether they're built for a tougher opponent is, I think regardless at this point, I think they know how to win. They know what to do to get the goal and they will, they'll do it no matter what. So it might be different and it might be scrappy, <laughs> but you don't always need the, like the wonderful, lovely, majestic victories. That's fair. That's fair. Yeah, no, I mean, I think the San Jose victory is a good point. Um, the fact that they were down that whole game, really not performing very well that whole whole game at home. Um, and they came out with the victory. That's a, that's a great point. So, I, you know, I, I think you're right. I think we're just waiting for them to play. It's, it's not their fault that they haven't had a team on the schedule that right. is going to be in the top four so, um, of, of either conference. So that moment will come. It just hasn't come yet. Um, but it'll come. And at that point, we'll be able to judge them maybe a little better. But I do think that this team is, you know, beating a team 5-1, beating a team 3-0 with three goals in the first half. Like, those are things that translate to other other games, I think. And it won't be 3-0 and after the first half or 5-1, but I think those are still competitive yeah. games. So I have a question for you. Yes. Um, there's a lot of controversy about letting Joseph Martinez go and him joining Inter-Miami, which is obviously a conference rival and – this danger of playing against him. Do you think Atlanta United is better off without Joseph Martinez now? I think that maybe they can focus a little more on the other players and it's not as much about Joseph Martinez. I, I mean, they look great. They haven't had a real true striker. Like I think this is, this was their new Gigi's new, because apparently that is what they call them in Atlanta. Mm -hmm according to our producer, Edwin. Um, I think this is his first real game, like getting full game time. So, um, like, I think they're fine without him. I think it was the right move. Every At some point or another, every club legend, I think in soccer, maybe more so than some other sports, you have to move on. Like, you just have to move on, and you can't 
you know, you can't just stick around because I think at a point that, like you said, last season, they were worrying a lot about him and getting him playing time and getting him his moments. And a lot of the offense is surrounded by him. While I just think they're so free flowing now, they've got so many pieces in the attack. And I think, um, you know, just Wiley Arujo, um, Almada, Gigi, like they're so good and they have so many good pieces. And I think they benefited from letting go of Joseph Martinez. Interesting. I agree. There you go. Perfect. Um, let's move real quick. Uh, we got a couple more things to get through, to get to, but first I want to talk about some teams that we might be worried about. And our producer Edwin is going to pop up some teams. This is a, a segment we like to call time to panic. Uh, we're four games into the season and okay. some of the top teams have been struggling. Some teams have been struggling. Edwin, what teams do you have for us today? Let's see. The first one is Austin FC. They're two, two wins, two losses on the season. They've lost now to Houston and St. Louis City. Uh, they did beat Montreal and Real Salt Lake. Your thoughts, Lizzie? Austin FC, time to panic. Yes. Yes, I think it was... They started the season terribly. Um, CONCACAF Champions League, also terrible performance. You're losing out to a Haitian team, not to minimize the Haitian team's successes, but where you really came in as favorites. And of the two teams, were the only one to have home field advantage. Um, yeah, panic at this point, change the system, make a lot of changes, and Josh Wolf hasn't yet. So I think the panic really comes from there. Like, at what point... Do you see your team dwindle down the Eastern Conference table and still not make any adjustments? Yeah, I agree. I think it's time to panic. I think Austin is kind of living their worst fears right now. A lot of people were worried whether they were lucky last season. They haven't really beaten anybody good. Montreal is not very good. Real Salt Lake is not very good. And they've lost to Houston and St. Louis City. St. Louis City is is very good, it turns out. But I think <laughs> yeah. kind of, um, Edwin, next team. LA Galaxy, 1-1 one, one draw versus my Whitecaps this past weekend. They've only played three games as opposed to some of the other teams. Uh, Lizzie, LA Galaxy, time to panic. No, I think it's still too early in the season, and there's been a lot of um, off-the-field action to switch things up. Um, obviously, we saw the departure of Arauco. We've seen their team struggle with the fans, obviously. There's a lot of turmoil within the team right now. Their first game being canceled just two days before. I don't know. I think it's been a little chaotic for LA Galaxy. I don't think they've quite settled into the 2023 season. Um, they have some good players and some key pieces, and they've just signed another figure. So, no, not quite time to panic yet. I maintain my personal opinion on LA, LA Galaxy. I think the panic was already there before mm -hmm. the season started, and I don't think anything's changed. So I don't know if it's time to panic. I would say it's not time to panic, but I think that, they're again, their beliefs are coming true about this team. Thankfully, Chicharito has been hurt, so that's something right. like that he can come back and see if things can change. Next team, Edwin. This one. Still duping. Duoping. I don't even know what that, that oh, phrase dude. stands for, but still duping with Philadelphia Union. Philadelphia Union now, they've struggled a little bit, lost to Inter Miami, who yeah. has lost their last two games to NYCFC in Toronto. Um, they lost on the weekend to Montreal. Um, they do have two wins, I think, this season, though. Um, they do have two wins uh, this season. Lizzie, is it time to panic with the Philadelphia Union yet? No, not yet. I think they've struggled a little bit, um, but we know what this team is capable of. Jim Curtin is a phenomenal coach. I think things will change a little bit. Um, I think this is kind of coming off of the MLS Cup loss, and they're just now coming to terms with it. So it's restructuring, understanding the situation, and coming back better. Um, we also know goalkeeper Andre Blake, who's phenomenal and a key part of that team is injured for a couple weeks so that's you can't do anything about that so no I don't think it's time to panic I would agree and only because of this past weekend I thought that they dominated Montreal but the red card hurt them yeah. um, I don't I am worried though about their offense they did win 4-1 against Columbus but two penalty kicks in that they haven't scored many goals other than that so 
maybe down the road it's time to panic, but at this current moment, I'm going to give them a pass due to the fact that I think they could have be they would have beaten Montreal if it wasn't for the red card. And Edwin, I think you have one more team for us. He does. Orlando City SC. Wow, I was expecting I was either expecting this one or Cincinnati as the, as the team, but Orlando City SC they lost two one at home to Charlotte. Um, they're out of CONCACAF Champions League now after their loss to um, Tigres yeah. at home. Ironically enough, Orlando City plays Philadelphia Union this weekend. Your thoughts, uh, is it time to panic for Orlando City SC? Also, no. Um, CONCACAF Champions League was probably exhausting for them, and they held their own against Tigres. That 0-0 draw at the Volcan was great. Um, Tigres, again, is a CONCACAF um Champions League favorite going into this tournament this year. So getting that draw and then losing, I think it was like 1-0, something like that at home. They're a difficult opponent. I'm guessing that was exhausting for them. They're just coming back from that now. And yeah, I, I don't know. I think this is Orlando. They're scrappy. They struggle. And then they somehow find a way to climb those rankings. So this isn't necessarily groundbreaking, but I also don't think it's time to panic. Uh, that home and that home match, they tied one one, lost on away goals in that. Match. Oh, see, uh, like that's a great result against an opponent like Tigres. Like Austin FC lost to a team that hadn't played in like two hundred forty six days. Mm-hmm. Like Tigres is great. Yes. So. Tigres did have a red card in this match as well, so awesome. uh, just something to note. But. I am going to go opposite of you on this one. I think it is time to panic, and oh. purely because they're not scoring a lot of goals. Right. Their only goal against uh, Red Bulls was a penalty kick. They've only they only scored one goal against DC United in one one tie. They did have a good match against Cincinnati, but still only tied them zero zero draw. And they only scored one goal against the Charlotte team, who's been leaking goals. So I think it's time to panic for Orlando City. I see that attack should be much better defensively. They're fine. But I think they're also getting held up defensively by Pedro Galise. I think he's been phenomenal. So I think it's yeah. time to panic for Orlando City. Interesting. There you go. All right. That's that was a little that was fun. I enjoyed That's that. Fun. Thank so you, fun. Edwin, for the help on that. Um, one last thing before we move on. We have one last thing to talk about. Lizzie, I did mention it already. Inter okay. Miami did lose. They did. They did lose again. They did. Just just give us just uh, we're gonna give you the floor. I'm gonna I'm gonna <laughs> mute my mic. And I'm going to give you the floor. Um, I would just like to personally thank Phil Neville from, um, for proving me right of what I said. Um, the past two podcasts, Inter-Miami are not the big dogs of the East. They do not know how to come back from a loss or just a come, back, come from behind victory. He has no idea what he's doing. It's really up to the players to figure it out on the field. And they just haven't quite yet. I'm not saying the first two games were a fluke. They they did well. The goals were there. Um, but yeah, this team has so much more potential and they need a new head coach to lead and maximize that potential. So thanks inter Miami. Um, you won't, you're not, you're struggling now. So thanks. And you could see the smile on her face. She's just <laughs> yeah. so excited that she was right about this. <laughs> well, oh, because I, was- listen, they, they look so good in the first two matches. And then it was just like, oh man, we're really good. Like we could beat these teams. And they went to NYCFC and took on Toronto and it was like, okay, maybe we're not that good. So uh, definitely the good. Players at players are so good though. Season. Like they are good, but you don't like the problem with this is that you don't like once you're down by a goal, you're not adjusting anything. Phil Neville's kind of just hoping like, okay, tie the game or figure it out or do what you've done in the past. And then you're down by two. And again, he does nothing to adjust. The substitutes aren't correct. They don't help the situation. So, like, at what point do you say he's a good head coach, like, figuring things out? No, it's been two games at a time. I have a question. Okay. Um, Is it possible that Inter-Miami is losing because Phil Neville can't do his sun dances because they played in New York City and Toronto the last two weeks because it's been cold and the sun (laughs) dances don't work? Yeah, figure it out. I don't know. I, he's got to figure out. Maybe he's got to do a snow dance. Does that I can't, help? His team? I just, I can't. I can't. I, <laughs> I, here's the thing. This is why it's frustrating. I think Inter Miami has so much potential. I think these are young players, I think they have talent. Like it's not a situation where it's 
35 year old plus players just trying to like figure it out on the field. Like, no, these are good players. They have talent. They're young. They're ready to play. But I just don't think Phil Neville is the guy to lead them. And everyone's like, yeah, no, he's fine. He's good. We'll keep him. He got to the playoffs last year. Okay. But what did he do? Like, that's sad that that's your like high bar is getting to the play, like qualifying to the playoffs. I do. I understand. I understand. Yeah. I'm interested to see they return home this weekend against mm-hmm. Chicago. That's a Ooh. game they should win with ease. Yeah, I could, you know, yeah. I could put together eleven of my, you know, the, the Chicago's not good. <laughs> I don't want to insult them, but the Chicago's not good. Chicago's um, not very good. They, they lost sign a good um, Bachuca player player with Alonso Aceves, so they might be a little bit better. But yeah, they they struggle. Um, yeah. All right. I think that's it for MLS. Yes. I think, um, I think that's it for MLS guaranteed win this week from our producer, Edwin. He thinks inter Miami. Um, wow. He thinks inter Miami is guaranteed to win this weekend, probably because of the sun dances. Cause they return home. Yeah. It's supposed to be warm probably. So it's been like, it's been like weirdly cold in Miami. Oh, I mean I like, know. okay. And I'll preface this like cold in Miami <laughs> is like 60 degrees. Okay. So it's been like cold ish and windy. So we'll see if they can, that's considered sun for him. But uh, well, I think we're on the Liga Max now, right, Lizzie? Yes. Moving on to Liga Mekis, we are talking about the two Clásicos, Chivas America and El Clásico Regio, Tigres Monterrey. Um, let's start with Club America against Chivas, which was a phenomenal game and completely dominated by Club America. They started off, um, with a 4-0, and then obviously it concluded with a 4-2. But it was a huge showing for Club America, especially against a team like Chivas, who had been gaining momentum throughout the season and came in in a decent moment of their season. Um, they really expected to deliver a little bit more. And obviously there was build-up because they're rivals. It's always the like hottest game of the season. Fans hate each other. Like This was expected to be something huge and to have Blue America come out and dominate 4-0 like that's that's unreal um but <laughs> as I was explaining to Gino you know, before recording there was a little bit of controversy with the goals um Henry Martin really just like an homage to Cuauhtémoc Blanco celebrated one of the goals by peeing and like ish showing that on all fours um inside the goal and chivas fans were not happy they were saying that's um disrespectful and he should issue an apology which he did after the game now before we get into yes exactly um that was Henry Martin and i don't see the problem on the right that was my next question for you before we get into like the actual game and the analysis of the game what do you think of this so I, this is my opinion on the whole situation. If I was Chivas, a Chivas fan, I would be so mad. If I was a Club America fan, I would be so happy and think it's funny. And as a neutral, I think it's hilarious. <laughs> but I understand the anger from the Chivas fans purely because you just got spanked for two. Like this is this wasn't a this wasn't a like a 4-2 where it was like 2-2 or 3-2 and then there was a late goal. Like Club America was up 4 nothing at one point in this game and there was an own goal scored by Club America that made it 4-1. So this was like an absolute drubbing of Shivas in this game and I can understand being upset but also like the reasoning behind it. Like this guy obviously like, does all of these celebrations that his favorite player did. Like I don't yeah. like, I, I, you know, it's... It, you had to expect it. I mean, it's not really that big of a deal. It's not like he was like, he came up with this on his own. Right. <laughs> like, and I also think he's it's, copying. it's a little hypocritical of Chivas fans because when Alexis Vega scored on Club America in the past, he pulled down his pants and wound people. Um, so it's not like Chivas fans or Chivas players haven't done a similar celebration with the same intent meaning. So... Yeah, it's hypocritical. Obviously, had this been the other way around, like you just said, they would have been celebrating like there's no tomorrow and saying, that's football. And I do want to preface this by saying there was um, a project done by Pepe del Bosque putting two players together. Um, I think it was in Nene Beltran 
or Victor Guzman with Henry Martin, and they were doing a podcast together, kind of previewing the game. And the two of them spoke, the players spoke, and they were not complimenting each other, but both were saying, like, I respect the way that you play, and I respect the way that you play. And fans complained about the fact that they were too friendly with each other, that they should spike things up, and they should um, hate each other. And people, some people were tweeting, like, moi, moi, like, you're, you're kissing each other. Like, okay, if you, they respect each other off the field, like, you hate them. It's okay to respect your – like, like the, I think the thing people have to understand is, like, these guys also don't just play for – like like Shivas for their entire careers or Club America for their entire careers. Like they're, they're teammates on the Mexican national team. But yeah. my they problem is not the fact that they respect, respect each other. It's yeah. the fact that you're complaining that they respect each other, but when they show a moment of personality hating the other team, then you complain about that. So I guess um, really people will never be happy. But I don't see anything wrong with Kenny Martin's celebration. I thought it was funny. I thought he really just likes Baltimore Blanco, which as everyone should. So it was hilarious and it was very deserving. It was a great goal on his part. Um, great performance by Cabecita Rodriguez, scored the first two goals, really just has been on fire. And Cop- Chia's def- like defense, they really didn't know how to react because Cabecita scored the first two goals in the exact same way. So they should have reacted at that point. And then obviously we know Leo Suarez also scored. And those are the four goals for Club America, which yeah. really are the most important ones and won't get into the Chivas ones because they don't matter because they lost. Yeah, they. I mean, they just dominated Chivas' this whole game. I mean, 4 yeah. nothing at one point, like, again, like I said, I mean, you can't, you can't, you know, you, can, you, you can't argue, you can't argue that. I mean, they yeah. just dominated this game. It's a, sh- it's a shame because we were talking about Chivas a couple of weeks ago yeah. and saying, man, like they were on a great run. Alexis yeah, Vega wasn't playing for them. They were doing really well. Because Alexis Vegas hurt, and when he comes back, they're going to be great. But this was a, a a poor performance from them, and and I think they lost last week too. So two straight poor for poor. poor I will say, um, no. Alexis Vega finally made a comeback from his injury, and he played the last forty five minutes of the game. I was against this really after watching. I think it was completely forced. I think it was the narrative of like a comeback against Club America and doing some damage, but it, he really just looked forced. I don't think he could run at full capacity. He wasn't making um, the necessary defensive movements as I would have guessed he's afraid of getting injured once again. So he wasn't at 100% and rushing him back, especially when it comes to a knee injury. That is so delicate and having him come pl- like play when you're already losing a game, it's, I don't know. I, I was against it. A lot of people applauded the coach's decision. I, I think I would have left him out. And if you're already losing, you might as well continue to do so and not risk him. Yeah. Yeah, I would agree. Just sorry, I'm trying to make sure I wasn't on mute. Um, I, I agree. I would agree. Um, I would agree. I think, you know, it, it's best to just continue to work him back and not put him in situations where he could get hurt in a situation that doesn't really matter. You're going to yeah. need him for the big game. So keep him on the sidelines. But you know, we'll see what happens going moving forward. But, uh, but you know, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and fault. in the other Clásico, um, Clásico Regio, Tigres against Monterrey, Tigres continued to struggle. They lost 1-0 against Monterrey um, with a goal by Luis Romo, which great phenomenal for the Mexican national team. He's off to international duty, which we'll get to in a second. But Tigres continues to struggle. As you mentioned before, the only reason that they beat Orlando City was on a technicality, essentially, and away goals, which is severely concerning. Again, you're considered a favorite going into this tournament. And, you know, as you said, it's time to panic for Orlando City. So the fact that Tigres couldn't um, develop that victory or momentum Truly concerning, and I think I will point out once again that I think Yo Herrera was right and unjustly fired for saying that um, what should he do because they have an old roster. I think if you notice the team without Iñak, they do play better. Mm -hmm. They aren't as slow. They don't drag. Cordoba plays better, and it's unfortunate because – Gignac isn't going anywhere anytime soon unless he retires. He's the figure of the team. They won't bench him. So this is my thoughts on this. Okay. 
Tigres needs to figure out how to put the ball in the back of the net because it's not like they're getting the, not getting the chances. In this match, right. they had 61% of the possession, 15 shots, and eight on target. Yeah. Monterey had 13 shots, two on target, with only 39% of the possession. Yeah. You got to put the ball in the back of the net. With all the yeah. money they spent on the talent that they have up front, somebody has to put the ball in the back of the net. Eight shots yes. on target, 61% of the possession, not having a single goal against, and th- th- again, that's what they did defensively against the best team in the league and the best team in the league by far at this, at this current moment. Yeah. I think they're up eight points in the league. What they did defensively was fine. But right. they cannot they cannot get the ball in the back of the net, which is a major problem because, again, they spent a lot of money on their attacking products already, spent more money to bring Diego Linez in, which was supposed to be another big attacking upgrade. Yeah. And they it. can't find the back of the net. And I'm just looking now yeah. to see what the last few games have looked like for them. Again, they have not um, – they have not – They've only scored the one goal against Orlando City right. in, bo- in both rounds. Only scored one goal. Yeah, against and Orlando I do want to say they did score that without Gignac. Without Gignac, um, but they had I think twenty two or twenty three shots in the first round in the in their home match against um, Orlando. Well, City. I will say there. I think if you, I would take out the Orlando City matchups just because Pedro Alese for Orlando City really did play hero. Like yeah. in that first game, there's about five goals that easily could have come in without just a phenomenal goalkeeper, which he is. Yeah. Um, I do fair. also think we need to point out the coaching situation. They haven't had it easy. After Piojo, obviously we know Diego Coca came in and lasted for about two weeks before the Mexican national team swooped him up. And now they have Chima Ruiz who came up through the ladder and doesn't necessarily have – I think the personality and the ability to prove himself with a team as demanding as Tigres, they expect a lot of their head coach in terms of personality and like taking things at the helm. And I think he's being bossed around a little bit by the players. I don't think he has their respect and at this team you need it. An interesting point that you're making there and (laughs) this, the stats back it up, or at least how many goals they're putting in the back of net backs it up. Um, February 11th was the last time they scored more than one goal in any match. And they've only scored one goal in any match in one, two, three, four games of, I think, nine or eight or nine. So they've only scored one goal. So that's four goals over those eight or nine matches. February 11th, interestingly enough, was, I believe, the first game that their new coach had after Coco. Yeah. So really since that game, and that was really, you know, Coco probably left it, let them, led them through a bit of training that week. They right, had a plan but... or whatever. But since that match, they have looked absolutely like they can't find, find the back of the net. Yeah, and been... they played Juarez, Atlas, Necaxa, Guadalajara, uh, Chivas, um, Club America, and Monterrey at this point. So – yeah, and against teams like Atlas, Juarez, Necaxa, like uh, you really should be winning those. Yeah, quite easily. Absolutely, absolutely. So it, there's definitely. I think if we're talking about time to panic, I think it's time to panic for. Oh yeah, I think it's right, right now because weeks ago, but now I think it's yeah. time to cry, if anything. Yes. Um, yes. So no. yeah, I, I think it's they have what? Like, just real quick to wrap this up, they have one, two, three, four, five matches left in yeah. uh, the Clausura. Yeah. And they do have a bunch of easier games coming up. They have Toluca, which will be probably a little bit more difficult. But then it's Mazatlan, Querétaro, Puebla, and Leon, and those all should be winnable games for them. So let's see. Is what it happens. is it Querétaro away though? Querétaro. Let me see how they have this. It is yes, I think away. So I don't think that one is necessarily as easy as we know. Querétaro has been given the go-ahead to open up their stadium to fans after the one-year ban. So, And we saw that um, last weekend that they scored right away and everyone's really excited. The players really want to stun at home. So though in reality it should be an easy game, I do think they'll get um, that 12th man on the field with their fans. Yeah. And I don't think it'll be that easy. That's a good but, point. That's a good point. But again, there's a lot of chances for Tigres to prove themselves over the next few weeks. Yeah. And I think if they can, depending on what happens in the next Querétaro. Did I do it right? Very good. There you go. Um, 
But depending on how the next few weeks go, their last five matches go, that'll determine on how they perform in the playoffs. Yeah, but they'll make it nonetheless. They're going to make it, but it's yeah. a matter of how far they get once they get there. I don't think And I think if they continue on the streak that they're on, it might even be a first round exit. Yeah, I don't think they'll make it far. Um, we know, obviously, moving away from Liga Mekis, there is international action yes. this weekend. Um, Mexico play Suriname in the Nations League, Concraft Nations League. United States men's national team play will be hosting a Twitter Spaces tomorrow to talk it through and talk everything since we talked about Liga Mekis and MLS a lot today. So very exciting international duty for Mexico. We know Santi Jimenez is on fire. Very exciting to see him back for the United States men's national team. It's fascinating to see Gio Reyna come back into the fold and obviously Alex and Dejas to play for them at the top. So, so many exciting things to look forward to. So much international action to watch MLS is not pausing, so there's still going to be MLS action this weekend. Um, it's going to be very, right. very interesting. You're going to see a lot of players you've never heard of before. <laughs> a lot. Like, I, they should have paused. But anyway, um, as always, thanks for listening. And follow us on our social media channels, Not Even USA, Instagram, Twitter, personal channels, anything. Subscribe to YouTube. Yeah. Thanks again. Peace. Bye.